Okay. So we have um, our metal damage program with Joel Bowie and Chris Fox. Um, Joel and Chris are military or military experts um, in the area. Bowie is the director of historic arms and Mil military at Skinner. Um, he's an antiques roadshow uh, presenter. Uh, lifelong resident of Concord. We will forgive him and allow him to uh, do the program regardless. Um, Fox, Chris Fox is the Associate Deputy Director of uh, American Furniture and Decorative Arts at Skinner and a former Curator of Collections at the Fort Ticonderoga Museum. Um, we're going with short introductions because both of, both of these guys have done a lot of work in um, the Rev War field and so we would be here all night or all day if I gave you all of their credentials. Um, but they're working on a really great project. Thank you for joining us, Joel and Chris. Um, is there anything you guys want to say about yourselves before we get started? No, but I just want to say happy Patriot's Day to everybody. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, normally this would be right in the middle of the afternoon parade. So we're used yep. to a very different kind of a situation. Yeah. Uh, but we're glad everyone's here and we're glad that people like Joel and Chris stepped up to, you know, offer us to provide new content and then interesting new research um, while we're dealing with all being stuck at home. <laughs> so, all right, so we're gonna get started. Um, Joel and Chris can both answer this question, but how did you get started on this project that you're doing now um, to locate and document uh, battle damage from the battles of Lexington and Concord? Well, it started out um, as a ballistic study, actually. Um, we, were, we were actually doing live fire shooting to better understand the arms um, and how they act or react, um, as well as recovery of the fired ball, um, which was something we decided we were going to put together a deformation index. This kind of carried off of the Parker's Revenge project, uh, the archaeology project. Um, and then as we morphed along, um, Chris and I went to Arlington Historical Society to go visit Sarah Lundberg over there and see some artifacts. And we decided, oh, let's go take a look at some of the bullet holes in the house. And as we looked at them after doing all this ballistics work, um, we looked at everything with totally different eyes. And we were able to um, see where balls came from, where they exited, where they went. Um, and we ended up going through the whole house and finding a lot more ball strikes than they ever knew existed. Um, so that was kind of the start of it. And then Chris and I, you know, left there very excited that day. And I remember sitting at the uh, at the barbecue place in Arlington, the uh, Blue Ribbon. Blue Ribbon, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Chris and I were both silent. And, and I could see him pondering and, you know, trying to figure out what we should do. And then we decided, well, let's make this a little larger. Let's go back. Let's bring some, um, some other ballistics experts. One of them was Dr. Douglas Scott, who a lot of people will know from the little Bighorn Battlefield work. He's a really knowledgeable ballistics expert. And so we contacted, uh, Chris and I contacted Doug, and Doug and I were presenting a paper at the SHA conference in Boston, Society for Historical Archaeology. And we decided we were gonna go back the day after uh, the conference was over um, with a group of us with ballistics rods and a theodolite and, and equipment and try and identify all the directions where all the ball came from as much as we could. Um, and then it exploded from there. Go ahead, Chris. Well, I think you pretty well covered it. <laughs> but um, when we went to the Historical Society, we went there to look at um, objects that they have in the collection that have known bullet strikes, um, a piece of a door or a panel from a door from the Adams house just down the road. Um, they had a couple of shutters, some other fragments and some other musket shot that had been collected. And um, he draws right as we were sort of looking through the house, looking at the bullet strikes to, uh, you know, just get a kind of refamiliarize ourselves with them. We started realizing that there are other holes that, that appear to be bullet holes and uh, the more we looked at them using the knowledge that we had gained um, from prior experimentation it became real clear very quickly that some of these holes were totally unknown to the folks or had been forgotten perhaps over the years and um, sort of one thing led to another and uh, out of this has come a much wider study trying to track down and examine and document all in structures and other objects. 
What were the um, other organizations? I know you contacted us and, you know, you've taken a look at uh, some of our strikes at Monroe and Buckman, and we'll talk a little bit about um, the Buckman one in particular, but what are the other organizations and other uh, sites you examined? Well, one of the others is the uh, Acton Memorial Library, um, and they have the James Hayward Powderhorn, uh, which he was struck in Lexington at Fisk Hill and mortally wounded that day, and the ball went through his powderhorn. Um, so we were going to be seeing, you know, I've seen it a bunch of times. We used it in an exhibit, but we were going to go back and look at it again and, and you know, measure the ball strike and, and, and everything else. But, you know, obviously with what's going on now, that's going to be delayed a little bit. Um, you know, we've got also the, the Merritt Monroe House in Lexington, just off the Common, um, which we'd like to go see the, the strike they have. Um, there's the church in Cambridge that purportedly has a ball strike. So we're, we, we've, we're almost through um, the ones that we know for sure are April 19th. We've got a little bit more to do, but, but we're almost there. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, so cycling back to what we're going to look at more specifically today, which would be um, the examination of the bullet strikes at Buckman Tavern. Um, I was interested that the blog post that Joel and Chris wrote that is um, talks a little bit about the strikes and the research they did at the tavern um, and we'll be publishing on our blog. Um, but I was interested that you guys titled it The Scene um, Had Changed. And that sort of talking about Post, um, post the battles of, you know, Old North Bridge and Lexington, but on the retreat from Boston, especially from Lexington on. Um, do you guys mind letting all of us know a little bit more about sort of the tenor of the fighting and why there might be, you know, so many ball strikes at Jason Russell or something like that? Yeah, I mean, one of the things, um, you know, uh, Reverend William Gordon wrote that, that letter in May uh, to a friend in England, and he mentions that, and he mentions the scene changed because, um, as Smith's force that was in Concord is coming back through into Lexington, um, they're about out of steam. They've lost a lot of men. Um, they're almost out of ammunition, but then Percy's relief force arrives and the scene changes. Here are a bunch of fresh um, soldiers with, you know, full stock of ammunition who are, to be blunt, pissed off. And so um, they basically surround Smith's column um, burn the Loring, Bond, and Mulliken House and Barns and outbuildings, um, go to Monroe Tavern. And while they're there, the relief force starts to hear about some of the things that had happened along the retreat route from Smith's forces, including one of them being the incident at the North Bridge where um, purportedly uh, one of the British soldiers who had been killed there was scalped and his eyes gouged out and ears cut off which is a little extreme It one of the soldiers came across the bridge and put a hatchet through his skull, which isn't great either. But um, so anyway, these things really infuriated um, the, the regulars who were returning back to Boston. And so things changed. Uh, they started shooting out the doors and windows of the houses, entering houses, trying to burn houses. Um, and it just got really ugly from, from that point back. It really became all-out war from that point back to Boston, unlike anything that had been seen really in the country since, well, since the French and Indian War. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's something that's significant that we sometimes miss if we talk a lot about just the battles of Lexington and Concord, but the fact that this was essentially, you know, a marathon. It was a whole, you know, the whole march out and then the return, which was a running battle, you know, the whole way. And like we said, we haven't seen anything like that up to this point um, in 1775 or in, in the sort of progression of the war uh, beginning to start. Um, so I think that is really interesting and that's why um, you're probably, you know, why there's this concentration of strikes kind of in this stretch from about Lexington to Cambridge probably. Are there any musket strikes in Boston when they're returning or are they pretty well, they, much? They return when they get to uh, Monotomy, which is, you know, a village in what was then Cambridge and now Arlington. They divert their route back. Percy makes a decision to cut across. Instead of going through Cambridge, they cut across and go through Charlestown. You know, they get, he figures that if they get to Charlestown, they will be safe. They can close the neck off and then um, go back by boat um, to Boston. But it's hard because there's 
the buildings don't survive anymore um, in that area. So I think the last building that might have a ball strike from April 19th that we know of is the church in Cambridge where they kind of made their turn to head towards Charlestown. But according to the accounts, uh, the fighting was was just as heavy, just as brutal all the way back till they, till they crossed the neck in Charlestown. Yeah. Okay. So it's still, like we were saying earlier, it's still possible that you know, there may be musket ball strikes from um, from this day in attics or that kind of thing still that just aren't known of yet. There, there may be. be. I mean, in some of the private Leon houses along the route that date to the 18th century, it's entirely possible that there could be some strikes that are totally unknown still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as we mentioned at the Historical Society, we have at least a couple of musket balls that were found in someone's attic um, and you know that's that's how they get there it's not like someone's storing them up there on the floor um, there's they're you know getting there because they were fired in at one point um, and so that's and then they were donated to us after that so there's definitely some data that we've gotten from people previously returning uh, musket balls so to speak um, and then we got to have you guys come so on March 13th which is just before we all kind of went into lockdown into quarantine um, we had a not six feet apart, but, you know, we had a good research session uh, with Chris and Joel, and they came to visit uh, Buckman Tavern and Monroe Tavern. Um, and you guys started off at Buckman because we knew, you know, the historic front door has a, a, a ball strike through it. So that was a really good one to start with. Um, you, can you guys share a little bit more about your methods, how you examined uh, that particular site, and also your methods overall? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. This is a good one for you. Well, so we, we first, you know, we knew about the, the ball strike. So you go in, like doing anything, try to keep an open mind, look at what does it look like? You know, physically, does it look like it's potentially a ball strike? And it became quite apparent very quickly that, yeah, without question, it is. You know, we looked at the exterior side of the door and it had a very, very round uh, entry point. Um, it was interesting to see that it passed through the wooden panels, the structure of the door at quite an angle before it emerged out the back side. And like we've seen in the other, um, other like in the Jason Russell house, for example, when the ball emerged from the back side of, of the door or the wood, it um, at the same time splintered out quite a bit of excess wood around that, that exit hole. Now we also tried to track approximately where um, that ball may have struck inside the house because it didn't lose all of its velocity when it passed through the door. And, um, you know, we looked all around in the, the architectural elements there. And, and, and as you had pointed out, there had been some restoration in that, in that front area. And we weren't able to see anything obvious as a strike. And more than likely, at some point in the, what, 19th or early 20th century, um, it got, it just got removed. So we, you know, we couldn't find anything there. But what was really interesting when we uh, carefully inserted the ballistic rod to to really get a, a better sense on just, you know, where the ball came from, exactly what was the angle that it passed through the door, um, and then compared that with what we saw outside, we were able to, I think, make a pretty, pretty decent educated guess as to approximately where in the front um, the soldier who fired that ball was probably standing. And it's interesting that that ball strike is right near the bottom edge of the door. And one might think, well, why is it at the bottom? If a guy shouldering, firing his musket from the shoulder, shouldn't it be up higher? Well, we noted with the ballistic rod that the, uh, the path that the ball took through the door was fairly level. I mean, at an angle through the door, but fairly at a fairly, you know, even horizontal angle. And outside the, the tavern, of course, the, you can see that the tavern itself sits on a little bit of a rise as compared to the, the yard out front heading towards Massachusetts Avenue. And when you follow the line of that trajectory, uh, as you can see with the, you know, re recreating it based on what we saw in the ballistics rod, you can sort of walk down that little rise and you get to a point where if you can imagine a soldier holding his musket at the sh proper shoulder level and firing a shot, it lines right up at the bottom of the door. Right. Um, that was a pretty pretty cool aha moment, actually. Yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> it was, yeah, especially since it's, you know, literally right out front. You could see, uh, do you guys remember how far you thought roughly, again, based on the, the trajectory it might have been? Oh, well, I mean, it passed, when it passed through the door at 
the angle that it did, you know, it went through a fair amount of wood, which means it was still traveling at a pretty high rate of velocity. So one would have to presume that the soldier who fired that musket wasn't too terribly far away. What, maybe 20, 30, 40 yards, would you say, Joel? Probably, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah that makes sense. So, and that, you know, that's a perfect example of how this research will be able to enhance um, our interpretation and that of the other historic sites, because now, you know, we have this information that's been vetted and checked, and we can kind of tell visitors, you know, this is the historic front door, you know, everyone looks at it when they come visit, but here is, you know, we know it's at this angle, and so based on that, you know, there's a good chance that the person firing was was in this location, or at least roughly. Mm -hmm. um, just to give no. visitors that no. sense of visualizing it. Now, the other thing that's significant about this is that, you know, one of the things that we also do when we're looking at these, these holes is we measure as best we can the diameter of the, Im, of the point where the bullet entered the wood to see, you know, what, what size is that hole, because that is a good clue of helping you determine what type of musket likely fired the shot. Now, you know, that, that hole has been in the door for a long time. The door has been on exhibit. And it's not always been there with plexiglass over the front of it so people couldn't touch it. So, you know, one would ask, well, you know, maybe there's a certain amount of erosion that's happened around that hole for over the years from people touching it. And we've, we've looked at bullet strikes in other places that have been similarly exposed over the years. And, and I think what we're seeing is that while there may be a certain amount of if you will, sort of polishing from handling around the wood, like 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 imagine a banister going upstairs, a lot of use of that, it polishes it, but it doesn't appreciably wear the wood. Mm -hmm. So when we measured the diameter of that hole, it came out to around 70 or so caliber, 0.7 inches. And the great thing is, is that corresponds very, very closely with the size of the musket shot that were being fired from a British musket of that period. They're firing balls at roughly 69 to 70 caliber. American forces, the provincial forces, on the other hand, what we're seeing from projects like the Parker's Revenge, Ar Revenge Archaeological Project, as well as looking at um, guns that survive with very good provenance from April 19th, is that it appears as that a very large number, perhaps the majority of the folks involved on the provincial side, we're actually carrying American-made fowling or hunting guns, which are always of a much you know, noticeably smaller caliber, firing a ball that is maybe only 62, 65, 66 caliber. So, you know, looking at the size of that ball diameter, or the, the hole in the door, is another good indication that it was a British shot that made that hole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that gives us a real good clue. Um, you know, Chris was mentioning the, the door panel um, from the Adams House that we looked at uh, previous in Arlington. Yeah. And that one was listed as being hit by a British ball. Uh, but when we measured it, it was about a 62 caliber ball. So more than likely it was overshot from, from a provincial fowler um, that what came from across the street and, and went through the door. Um, so the, the size of the hole is important to us understanding what type of gun it might have come from. Mm -hmm. It's not absolutely foolproof, you know, but it's a very strong indicator. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things we've talked about is sort of to the diff distance or the difference between like a knot hole or a natural variation in the wood than something like this, where if you're finding, you know, something like the Jason Russell, where there's a number of holes that are more consistent in size, they're more consistently round. Um, I'm guessing that's probably information that indicates they're you know, more likely to be a ball strike than just sort of an irregular knot hole or something. Well, an, an, a knot hole, um, if you've looked at a piece of pine before and you look at how a knot hole, um, if, the, if that knot comes out, it's got a completely different look. It might look round on the face and it probably looks round on the back of the board. Um, but on a ball strike, you know, it, it's fairly round on the front depending on what it came through. Um, if it went through glass or another wall, it might change form. But as it exits that back side of that wood, it blows chunks of the wood out. Um, so, so that's how one of the ways that we're able to verify. Yeah. 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 Um, do you guys have anything else planned for this project? Or are you kind of winding things down on it? Well, well, I know it's never done. <laughs> no, no, well, no, and it's never going to be done because it's always something we can add to as we find out more. But Chris and I are working on, we have um, uh, mock-up house panels made um, from 18th century wood for the most part. 
um, that we're actually going to do a live fire experiment and try and replicate some of this data. Um, so Chris and I are working on down the road here once we can get back out again um, using some of the muskets. We've got the ammunition. We've got the the uh, the, the wall sections built um, and taking them out to the range and shooting them and, and seeing what we can replicate. That sounds really cool. <laughs> are you guys going to take video of that or how are you going to record, you know, I mean, I know it's fun, but are you, how are you going to record the data? Are you going to do the same measurements that you've done? Well, we're going to record it similarly. Um, we're not going to be able to do some of the high speed camera work that we were able to do in the ballistic studies, um, because that takes some really, um, expensive equipment and, you know, we're kind of doing this on our own. Uh, but we're going to get data, we're going to get video of this going on and stills and we're going to collect, uh, you know, the data. We're going to see the size of the hole as it goes through. We're going to see how it exits. We're going to see how it goes through the outer part of a house and then goes through paneling. Um, we've got all sorts of things planned for this. Chris and I have been thinking about this for quite a while. The other, the other neat thing that we've been doing when, when, we've, when we have had the opportunity looking at um, some of these uh, holes and some of the structures is we've been able to do some very simple low-tech chemical tests for actual traces of lead right. and in some of these strikes that are now 245 years old um, we actually are finding traces of lead that are still um, is still present on the wood so it'll be really neat when we do the the exper or exper experimental work to do the same tests on those panels just to verify in fact that it does leave a piece of lead right yeah. right that's a good point and, and yeah on, I mean, that's sorry on the Bachman know. door we couldn't do that um, because there's lead paint um, on on either side um, but the presumptive lead test it's it doesn't cause any damage um, and we have found some results um, in some of the other strikes um, that are present for lead so yeah we'll test that too yeah that's that's pretty amazing because you know like we said that we have a lot of stories about these musket ball strikes um, the historic houses that have them um, but having someone be able to come in and actually say, okay, yes, this, this is definitely confirmed, you know, based on ballistic study, studies, this is what it is, you know, it's definitely what it is, and here's the angle and that sort of thing. Um, there's so much more information we can share, um, and that's, you know, confirmation, too, when we visited Monroe, and I had a replica of a painting in my office that was in the other room of William Monroe III, and I said, you know, I think, I don't know if you guys noticed it first, but there's a small hole in the sleeve in the painting. And everyone, you know, said, what is that? And it's the story from the family that it was a musket ball from the British stopover that had gone through a painting. And, you know, it is difficult with those family stories, whether or not that actually happened or whether, you know, it, it fell off the wall and got punctured on something and they assumed it was from a ball or something. Um, but when you guys were able to examine it, it was a very clear, you know, the match on the diameter, I'm guessing, was oh, yeah. pretty consistent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was neat. That was really neat. <laughs> yeah. The, so, the, yeah. Go ahead. the neat thing is, is that, you know, you're, you're right. The, the question, of course, is, well, did the painting fall off or did somebody bump it or, you know, whatever. But in the case of this one, even though there's... Um, a, res a restoration on the back side to sort of close the hole. They didn't, they didn't seal in um, the hole itself. You can actually still see it on the painting as clear as day. And um, you know when when canvas has been painted, it it kind of it it, it kind of changes the uh, the overall structure of the canvas. It makes it very rigid. So when something like a musket ball that is traveling at a you know relatively high velocity hits it. Um, it literally pops a hole right through it. And, and what you see today is a, an almost perfect circular hole that when we very carefully measured it without touching it with the calipers, it turned out to be what, 70 caliber, right? Just about, yeah. It was Just about 70, exactly about what 70. it should be for a yeah. better shot. Yeah. Right. right, and that makes sense. I mean, even that concept of, you know, the stretch canvas being t more taut and easier to puncture, you know, with something, then that definitely makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, that was something that we really didn't know for sure. Um, if we could tell visitors, yes, we think this is, you know, that we have, as you guys know, and we'll talk about at some point, we also have um, a hole in the ceiling of the tap room at Monroe. Um, and that's something that the family, you know, was well aware of and, and basically plastered around um, because they really wanted it to be um, known for a long time. Um, and did you guys have some theories about that hole as well or oh yeah <laughs> you gonna hang on to him for now 
<laughs> we're, we're gonna we gotta keep some of the stuff under our cuff here. <laughs> <laughs> um, what kind of primary sources did you guys use for a project like this? Well, one of the things we've been doing is, and this has been going on for for quite a while, is going through um, every known. Um, and we don't know all of them. We're still finding them, you know, with sharing with other friends like Alex Kane, um, who is involved in Lexington a lot, um, you know, doing all John Bell, um, doing a lot of sharing and uh, trying to get, gather all of the accounts from from Lexington Center back that we can, as well as going through the Massachusetts Archives collection. Um, we've got all of the documents from the losses in Lexington. Um, in, in Cambridge that are known. And the, the documents themselves, the originals, um, are a little bit different than the transcriptions in the journals of each provincial Congress. Those were cleaned up in the 1830s, 1838, I believe, when it was printed. So they took out some of the character of the documents. So Chris and I have gone through and we've, we've looked at the original documents, transcribed all of those, um, so that we can add that into an appendix um, in the report with all of this. That's great. Yeah. yeah. And, in, and in going through the archival records, in a lot of cases, we're literally going through these archive volumes page by page. Some of these have finding aids, some of them have sort of vague descriptions of what's in them, but we found that you just got to go through the things page by page. And in doing that, I think we've been finding things that um, have not seen the light of day in a very, very long time that is just shedding more light on these events. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's one thing, you know, I always mention to people that I grew up in Lexington and I never knew how much I didn't know about the Battle of Lexington. You know, that's yeah. something that there's been so much new research and so many documents that, like you said, Chris, may have been seen at some point or published in a, a journal or something at some point, but maybe haven't been considered in this context or haven't been looked at recently. Um, and even that, you know, you guys looking at that stuff and transcribing it, you know, contributes to the, the research and figuring out the whole it adds to the whole story. Right, exactly. Anything surprising or exciting about your visit to us? The whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, Anytime good. that we get to see and verify a, a new hole is a, is a great thing. <laughs> it's a great day. That's true. Um, the yeah, one thing that we can to... save this for maybe another one, but we did, you guys had mentioned that there was a, was it a shutter or a door <clears throat> that had been struck by a ball and you thought was in Scotland? Well, there's a, we ran across a, a newspaper account. Um, uh, the account that I ran across actually was came out of a reprinted from a New Orleans newspaper and I think it was the 1830s, late 1830s, about a, a shutter that had come from, I guess, Lexington and shipped back to Scotland uh, at some point after, after the 19th. Um, people, what we're finding is that people, they understood really from day one that that what happened on the 19th wasn't just wasn't just some people that were a bit upset and you know temper is flaring this was big this was a this was the start of something really big that everybody knew was coming and when it came you know the people knew it was effectively going to be full on war and this was the very very first event and what they hoped i think many people hoped was going to be ultimately the the separation of the colonies in America from England. And, you know, people realized the significance of, of that moment and uh, immediately started saving pieces, saving relics, as they described them, from that day. And in the case of this shutter, at least, it made its way to Scotland. And the, the, the thing with the shutter, too, is um, we're now, we're trying to see if we can track it down in Glasgow. Um, but when we went to visit you, we were talking about the shutter and you said, wait a second, I think I have something you guys might want to see. And it was the Levi Harrington account that you pulled out and it was written late in life um, or it was written, it was, it was copied late in life and then transcribed again by a son, I believe. Um, but he mentions that shutter and he mentions it um, coming from Buckman Tavern. Um, which was which was kind of cool because I guess that's where it came from, um, but he says he was there and he saw it being taken that day. So, so yeah, so we've all volunteered to go to Glasgow to pick it up, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, find it first. Well, right. We'd like to think it still survives, and right? if it does, we're doing our darndest to try to find it. Right, 
and like you said, you know, a lot of your focus expanded during this project and you weren't just looking at, you know, the, the full historic structures, but architectural components and things like the painting, right. like the shutters that have come off and, you know, are smaller pieces that you can look at um, and try to figure out, you know, and that's one thing, as we know, architectural elements get separated from their buildings so they can end up in all kinds of crazy places. So maybe yeah. someday we'll find that one from Moscow. That would be We hope so. We hope so. <laughs> Um, is there anything else you guys want to share? I don't want to keep you too long. I'm sure you have other stuff you need to do, but. Well, I just, I hope that, you know, when we get this stuff done, um, you know, we're, we're putting a lot of work into this and effort because we love doing it. Uh, you know, Chris and I talk about this all the time. Um, but we hope, I think, that in the end, all of this stuff will be used for education. And what will happen is it might spark the interests of, you know, uh, seven-year-old kid like when April 19th hit me um, and interest them in learning more too because you know we're only going to live so long and you know we're digging trying to find information but there's a heck of a lot more out there to be found um, so if we can incite some young folks to get interested and you know go learn about the history that's fantastic that's what it's all about mm -hmm. yeah. and I think that's a big part of like we were saying that you know new research and, and shedding new lights on historical events helps remind people that it is, it's changing. It's not boring and static and dusty, that there's right. new information being found out all the time. Um, no, there the sure is. A lot of people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for joining us. Um, we look forward to finding out more about the research when it's compiled. Um, do you guys have any sense of the timeline on that? I know everything is delayed because of our current situation. Yeah, it's right now it's up in the air. We had hoped to be... I think completed by summer, yeah. um, but I think we're going to be a little more, a little, a little longer, so we can get the rest of the data and do our live we fire. Want make sure, we want to make sure that we get everything that we can in terms of looking at the uh, the potential holes, all the documentation that we have currently found, or maybe have a lead on. You know, we want to we want to do it to the best of our ability, so we want to get it out, but we don't want to rush it either. Right. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it's, I think it'll probably be ongoing work if there are more. Oh, yeah. Developments. Hopefully it will be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You guys are always welcome to come to our historic houses and poke around in the attics with the shutters. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Great. We appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys very much for joining us today and happy Patriots Day. Happy Patriots Day. Thank you, Stacy. Yeah. Thank you.